Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. And for some people, they're going to play that and they're going to be like, oh shit, that's hot. I didn't mm-hmm. realize that. I didn't realize this is the desire I could have. But also, I didn't realize that I could explore and, and experience desire through this way in a way that feels good for me and doesn't feel like it has the complexities of, like, say, expectations being placed on me from a culture, a society of sex mm. that I don't know if I want to have. I really think games, you know, games is play, and play usually is a really good way for us to sort of piece things out and understand ourselves better. Better, and that's definitely true of sex games and adult games. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and change them and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them, and trying to talk directly into the mic. (laughs) And this is Pixel Therapy. Uh, We have no new or noteworthy items to share this week. Gasp. We're boring. (laughs) So instead, I'll just remind everyone that we can't do what we do here on Pixel Therapy without the support of our lovely listeners like yourself. If you like the podcast and you'd like to get a little more, we do release an exclusive monthly bonus episode on Patreon. So go to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod and subscribe for just $2 a month to get that extra dose of pixel therapy in your life. Our July bonus episode will be dropping next week. And if you're not on Patreon, you won't get to hear it. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) But if that's not in the cards for you, remember it also helps to rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts. And we'd love to read your review on our next episode. Mm -hmm. So get out there and do it. Um, Or just keep hitting that download button when we drop an episode. We're happy to have you here, no matter how you choose to support the show. All right, folks. It's time to get cozy. It's time to pull up an armchair. Feel free to lie down on your couch. Let's talk about our feelings. Spencer, how are you? I'm good. Well, I wanted to close the loop on what I said earlier, which is (laughs) Jamie informed me that professional podcasters are really good about making sure they talk into the mic. We're not not professional. We are not professional podcasters. We are not professional. I just... I had to move around when I talk. I use my hands sometimes, and I, I always, I sometimes forget um, that I have to be good for <laughs> good audio. So I'm going to work on that. It's an opportunity yeah. area for me. <laughs> yes, well, me as well. It certainly wasn't uh, a critique that was directed at just one of us. <laughs> well, I mean, thanks for asking how I am. I, this was actually a really exciting weekend. Um, yeah. Because this, okay, Jamie Bum, came over to my house. And <laughs> yes, I did. Like, I, I'm not joking. Even though we've been friends for years, like, you've literally never been to a place that I, well, you've been to places that I've lived, but, like, it's been a long, 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 long time. Yeah, it's been a while. And I, and the reason for that is just because, like, I don't know. I would always have like a tiny room in a place or I just live in a place with a bunch of people, just like not have spaces to entertain. And so it mm-hmm. just felt really nice to uh, wake up this morning and Jamie and Colt were there. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> <laughs> and our dog Tess driving yeah, your Tess cats was there. up the wall. <laughs> yeah, they um, they were not as happy about the weekend, but that's fine. Um, the cats didn't care for the visitors. <laughs> you know, Specifically they did one not. visitor named Tess. And it was wild though because I have a tiny precious cat named Naomi. I call her Nomi. And she... I'd never seen her so angry. Like she took it upon her. She decided that it was her duty to protect the house and that there was yep. a wild beast in her space <laughs> and her tail puffed out and she was combing for Tess, like claws <laughs> out, hissing and spitting. I was like, oh my God, I've never seen her like that. And uh, it, I, I was amused because Tess is a 50 pound hound dog who's just completely yeah. oblivious and like was not even giving this like hissing <laughs> spitting cat the time of Eight day pound like cat yeah literally, literally walked past Naomi just like doing other things and Naomi's <laughs> like I'm gonna fight you yeah <laughs> and Tess is like what hi hello 
<laughs> Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> um, Carnars. but yeah, then then we just had to keep them on two different sides of the door. And uh but Naomi was right there every yeah, time someone ready. opened the door. She was ready. She was like, Is the dog here? I'm yeah. ready. I'm ready. We had to hold her back. Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, I actually, okay, so shortly after you left this morning, I just wanted to, since we're talking again to record this episode, <laughs> yeah, okay. um, I wanted to tell you about this this hike we went on. So I just mo- we just moved to this kind of small town, very Stardew Valley vibes. Um, and we walked to the park, and then we noticed that the park had this unmarked trail. And mm. it seemed to go... F- pretty far back into the woods and in the general direction of our house. Ooh. So we were like, why don't we just walk down it and see where it spits us out? Uh-huh. So we're walking, walking, walking. Um, and it kind of, a lot of different uh, nature. We saw lots of different types of mushrooms. Um, it was, you know, we kept walking and we weren't sure where we were going. Um, and then we came up on a sign and the signs on the trail were saying things like um, restaurant this way, uh, other restaurant <laughs> that way, like general store this other way. And we basically realized that our town, in addition to like the main streets, they just have these this network of trails that you can walk to get to various landmarks in the town, which we just thought was like really charming and cool. Um, Holy cow. So we got home because the the place it just cut, said like um this name of restaurant um rad burgers this way um we just kept following <laughs> the trees and it spit us out that at this restaurant that's right down the street from our house so um oh it was God. cool <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i love that it felt very uh open world exploration <laughs> <laughs> yeah did you gain any experience i feel like i did i feel like i gained stamina and also is there a skill about just general orientation? <laughs> uh, Navigation, wayfinding. There you go. There you go. Wi-Fi, there you go. Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> uh, I'm good. Uh, while you were hiking, uh, Colt and I were driving the two and a half hours back to our home. This makes it sound like I'm so active and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> while you were out for your hike, I was sitting very still in a car. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, it was it was super nice to get to see your home, and we really uh-huh. appreciated y'all hosting us uh, overnight and feeding us and yeah. taking us to your quaint little breakfast uh, slash market that we have nearby. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. And yeah, I'm just re- we're just really happy for uh, you and your partner and and the home that y'all are building out there. Oh, thank and you. we can't wait to come back and visit again. Hell yeah, yeah. Jamie and Colt slept in the PS5 room. We so. did. We did. Uh, and I kicked everyone's ass at Catan. So yeah, I'm happy, <laughs> happy to do that again anytime. Great. Come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are we talking about today, Spencer? Oh, Aside my God. From hiking. <laughs> Speaking of hiking, we're going to talk about a game um, that where you walk a lot, do a you lot of walking. Definitely walk a lot. And running. Um, <laughs> so this is a really good segue, right? I thought about that one. Like, Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> this is, you remember how I said earlier how we're not professional podcasters, um, <laughs> but go ahead. Oh, and there's also lots of rocks and moss and water, but it's called Where the Heart Leads, um, <laughs> developed by Armature Games. Um it came out on for PS4, but also PS5. Yeah, um, it's playable on PS5. Um, and Armature Games, I was kind of look. I'd never like. I didn't recognize the name, so I was kind of mm. looking through their stuff. It looks like they primarily do ports, primarily a port studio, so they port games to other mm. consoles and stuff. But they did make a Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate in 2013, which was a game that came out on Vita. Uh, and did get pretty good reviews, if I recall correctly. And then they also made Recore in 2016, which was one of the, I think it was supposed to be a launch exclusive for the Xbox One. I don't remember if it actually hit launch or not, but I remember there being a lot of buzz about it and then uh, some disappointment on the other side of the bus (laughs) when it came out. Um, But just suffice it to say, they don't, they've worked on a lot of games, but in a lot of uh, support capacity and porting. Mm. Uh, And this is kind of their first uh, narrative adventure. Very ambitious. Yes, an ambitious narrative adventure game. The winding and complicated narrative. Um, The, like, 
primary way you interact with the game is that you're moving a character through a 3D isometric viewpoint uh, of the world, and you are mainly just pressing X to interact with characters and objects throughout the world. Um, But it is a narrative adventure game, so you're making narrative decisions that ultimately affect the story. And I think you got to do this as a review copy, Spencer. So I was thinking you... They said in the review information that there were 16 endings. There are 16 endings and over 600,000 words of dialogue, um, which is actually longer than um, Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace, which is a very long book. (laughs) That's a lot of writing. Yeah. So, and it, yeah, it has dozen there's thousands of choices dozens and dozens of branching paths and like jamie said um like yeah 16 endings um of which we've maybe collectively have maybe seen two (laughs) yeah two (laughs) yeah i'm like halfway through my second playthrough there you go uh yeah i'm not sure what they consider to be the different endings because you get endings for various characters in the game so i'm not sure where they're counting the 16 Ooh, true. I guess wits. Oh, right. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but but set the game up for us. What's the yeah, what's the narrative of the game? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where the heart leads, um, you are Wit Anderson, uh, a family man waking up on your farm, your homestead. Um, you have a love. You have a beautiful, beautiful. You have a really cute little brown dog named Casey, <laughs> who you love very much, and. <laughs> You wake up on a dark and stormy night, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, lightning is crashing. You come outside um, after running after your family, and in when the commotion, when the dust settles, you realize a huge sinkhole has opened in your front yard. And not only that, but your little doggy has fallen right in. Um, mm-hmm. Not too far though, just a few feet down. Mm-hmm. So Wit um, kind of, they had this kind of pulley with a bathtub on it that they were using as a swing. Um, and Wit jumps in, um, pulleys himself down. And this is where, just for example, of the many branching choices you can make, <laughs> um, you can either try to save Casey um, or you can wait a little bit longer and see if you can figure out another way to get her out. And so um regardless of of which direction you choose upon which the multiverse opens up, (laughs) um, the rope snaps and wit is hurtled into the depths of the sinkhole. um, And so begins a journey um, back to the top, which is much longer and much more surreal than the journey down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as wit's trying to climb his way out of the hole, he starts to encounter events from his life and the story, uh, like pretty quickly, you find yourself uh, coming through a crevice and exiting as young Wit uh, on his family farm. That 17 you grew up years on. old. 17 years old. And that opens up the meat of the game, which is that you essentially play through the bulk of Wit's life, reliving his life experiences and having the opportunity to make choices for him about the direction that he's going to go in his life, the way he's going to color the relationships that he has with his family and his friends. And uh, yeah, ultimately influencing the entire like trajectory of his life and where he ends up and you play through his entire life from there on through the game. I think the this this narrative, this core narrative of wit and this idea of the way um, even decisions that can feel small or mm. moments that can feel small can have uh, a really dramatic and long lasting impact on our life, on our relationships with folks. I think that th- this is the both the heart of this game and also the thing that the d- game does best. Mm-hmm. Um I definitely have some issues with this game, which I think we'll get into in a little bit, but I want to start by just saying like narratively and the line by line writing of this game Mm. is some of the best I've encountered in a game like period hands down or even uh, 
as a, you know, as a piece of literature, I think you could almost mm-hmm. consider this with the 6,000 words. Um, 600,000. 600,000, sorry. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's so many words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I read a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the the actual, the characters that are on display here, the relationships that you're building and, and making those decisions, there were so many times a decision point would come up and I felt truly uh, frozen yes. by the idea of like, which direction should I take this? Um, even when it seemed like something that was small in the moment. I think the game does a good job of helping you quickly understand that these decisions are likely going to have a lasting impact because they're, there are decisions that Wit makes within the conversations of the game. They're not you're not choosing every line of dialogue that Wit speaks. Mm-hmm. It's very specific points where the game's like, here's a decision that you need to make. And I think that helps uh cement that those are the real uh turning points in mm-hmm. his life or the real points on which his his future will hinge. And uh yeah, I found I found a lot of that stuff really compelling and a lot of the dialogue really compelling. What about you? Yeah, I um I felt like the Wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pause. When you were saying um you weren't talking for him the the two like the it's more about giving you like general paths than than the literal dialogue that he's saying is that kind of is that kind of what you meant? No, I mean like you're not in some games with a narrative like this Every time a character speaks to you, you would have a, a choice of what to say back. You're not choosing every response that Wit gives. You're only being, a, a lot of the times he's he's speaking for himself. So you're still being presented with like who Wit is as a character. Like he's still grounded in himself. He's not entirely an avatar for you, mm-hmm. the player. Um, but when he comes up against key decision points, then you're given the choice to choose between the options that he mm. has. So you're not getting to completely decide who he is. He exists separate from you, but you do get to steer him down specific paths. Yeah, I think that's the part that I, I think there was an initial shock when I first started playing the game because it wasn't at all what I expected. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I felt like I would be wit more than sort of being an observer of his life and kind of a force mm. pushing or or tilting him in different directions. Um, and I mean, the really interesting part of the game, as we kind of touched on, is that you're not only living through wit's past um, and the events leading up to him falling into the sinkhole. You, the way you live his life, you could you actually are rewriting um, his present as well as his future. You're living through mm-hmm. his his whole life, and so. Um, I think I kept waiting for it to initially when I first was sinking into it, my first couple hours, I was like, okay, when are we getting, I don't know what I was expecting necessarily, maybe more of a, an adventure. Like maybe I was expecting the scale to be Mm -hmm. something bigger than just his life. But, but really what this story was, was super, super grounded in these characters living, um, you know, small lives and, 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 just trying to figure out who they are and and f- balancing work and family and and mm-hmm. home and I think it all just it it shocked me how real it felt and then when I sort of realized what I was playing I I did start to really really enjoy it and I was really blown away like you by the the writing um mm-hmm. like I I felt like I really knew these characters so all of that um it's it's unlike a it's really singular in I felt like how personal and intimate it was with these very specific characters. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. like reading a like reading a novel. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And I think uh, again, I think that's what the game does best is that they really the writers clearly really knew who these characters were, um, and presented them to us as like fully realized individuals. And did it in a way that felt very natural, that didn't feel um, like it was just full of exposition mm-hmm. um, or, or that characters had to like walk up and speak exactly who they were, what they were thinking or feeling all the time. I think, you know, as as far as like script writing goes, 
Um, the interactions always felt really natural and honest uh, to me. I think they kind of um, articulate this a bit in a conversation that that I was privy to later in the game that Wit has with his his daughter. And I don't think everyone can actually come across this conversation, but uh, the conversation that I have with her, she she makes this point about messy. Uh, they're looking at something. I don't want to spoil anything. So they're looking at something and Wit, Wit says that it's that it, the shape of it is messy. And she says, messy is also a shape, you know, the shape of broken things. We take wholeness for granted, I think. Messy is better sometimes, more true or real. The pieces don't always have to fit back together. It's okay to see the cracks, the flaws. It's beautiful in its own way. Hmm. I think that's one of the thesis thesis side thesis, <laughs> thesis of the game is is this idea that like realness is inherently like flawed and messy. Yeah, and I think too building on that a little, like the game really seems to be encouraging you to embrace the fact that even if you do everything right or um, even if you try your hardest, um, like sometimes things just don't work out and mm-hmm. sometimes your life ends up looking way different than you may have planned when you first set out. Um, and I think it teaches you, like, at least for me, like I, it felt like what it was saying about adulthood is like something that already like <laughs> me as a young old person, as in the <laughs> tender age of almost, of reading my, my late twenties, like <laughs> I know that there's a lot of life <laughs> ahead, yeah. but I still, you know, I, I think back to the, the, I'm reaching an age where I'm able now to think back to the person I was, mm-hmm. um, you know, f- three, five, 10 years ago and thinking about decisions I made and, and how they've impacted who I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, and wondering like, Oh, what if I had done something different? Um, and to the all the time you have when you're like a young person, like there's just mm-hmm. endless, endless time. And I mm-hmm. do feel like what this game brings into focus is the fact that like adulthood can really be about understanding that the choices that we make every day have more and more weight and that there are some things that we never will experience because we made a choice or mm-hmm. there are ways our life will turn out that never would have been possible before because we made a choice. Um and it just, you just start understanding so much more about that, I think, as you get older. And I thought the game did a beautiful job of really teaching that lesson. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll say the the game, essentially, as you're playing through Wit's life, it breaks itself up into three core chapters. Uh, the first being focused on this Wit at 17. Um, and, and the chapters essentially are a, a stretch of time where you play the game and time does not really fast forward in a significant way. You're playing through this this long stretch of the game that's really set at a specific age and time in, yeah. in Wit's life. It's like critical so, moments. Yeah. So, so you have this chapter where he's 17, uh, living on his parents' farm. Uh, you have this chapter where he's, I, I read him as probably late 20s, early 30s. Um, he's got two young kids mm-hmm. um, and a partner, and they have a home together. And you're making some decisions around the direction the family's going to go. And then you have this final chapter where he's uh, middle aged or a bit yeah. past middle age. Um, and there's kind of like these interstitials in between these chapters that give you a chance to like check in on characters or make a few key decisions as you move into the next chapter. But mm-hmm. essentially those are kind of the three focal points of the game. And the game kind of like, I don't remember exactly how it delivered this message, but it, it early in the, the first chapter where you're 17, it kind of makes this suggestion that there may not be enough time to do everything you want to do. And so as I was like making decisions in the first chapter, I kept thinking like, okay, well, uh, if I decide to help my dad build the barn, I might not get to go hang out with my girlfriend. So, mm. I, and and I was trying to like run around and balance his priorities. And I kept, I kept finding that like it, the game wasn't actually restricting me. Like everything was available. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, that's weird. Why did it try to tell me that like, I might have to make decisions about who I'm spending time with. If, if I was going to be able to spend time with everyone. Mm. And then you move into the next chapter and suddenly things don't work that way anymore. Mm. I found that like 
if I want, like, I missed talking to certain people because I prioritized other conversations. Yeah. And I think that like really it's like very subtly clicking on this point of like when you're young, you, it does feel like you have all the time in the world and you can do it all. Mm. And then as you get older, time starts to condense and suddenly like choosing to go have a conversation with one person might mean that you don't have a conversation with another person that could have opened a door for you. Um, yeah. So I thought that was a really subtle, interesting way to do it. And it was in that second chapter that the game really clicked for me Yeah, because I was operating under the assumption that the game was still working the way it did in the first chapter when I was young. Mm-hmm. And I made a few decisions about how, who I was going to speak to throughout this day. And I thought I was going to have an opportunity for a specific, I thought I was going to have a specific career opportunity made available to me. It had kind of been hinted at, mm. but I didn't go and talk to the person who would have been my boss if Oops. I had taken that career opportunity. And the day ended and I went to the bar with my partner and she has been offered the career opportunity. Mm. <laughs> and I had like this sinking like moment of realization of like, oh shit, like the game has just taught me that I let that go by and I didn't even realize I was making a decision to let that go by. And it was one of the most powerful moments of the game for me personally and was what hooked me into the rest of the game was this the sudden realization that like without even realizing that I was making decisions that were going to impact my opportunities I was doing it just by how I was setting my priorities within the game. Yes absolutely. I think to your point about messiness, like the quote about um, messiness and and the beauty there and the imperfections, like I feel like, um, I don't know, I'm used to, like I think, and in this game it exists too, like when you're presented with options, there's like dialogue options or Mm -hmm. branches. There's one that kind of stands out as like the good answer and one that's maybe like the more chaotic answer or sarcastic answer or oppositional answer. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of feel like you generally have a good idea of of where to take your character if you're trying to be a certain kind of person or play play a a good run, you know what I mean? And um, I think what really surprised me, but also something I really appreciated about this game was that like even if you try to be the best father possible, um, there still might be things outside of your control that spin characters away from you in ways that you may not Mm -hmm. have expected. And and it makes me think of what you just said about how sometimes your priorities, like you may not have ever intended, you know, to be not around for your kids, for example. You thought that by um, picking the options where you'd have a better job and be able to provide more, um, that your family would would prosper and be happy. But maybe you didn't realize the impact that that had on your kids who interpreted you as never being around. Mm-hmm. Like there's just things that don't even occur to you. And, and when it's condensed into this you know, 10, 12-hour game, um, it really stands out how in real life, like years can go by um, and and you can, like that can happen, it happens in real life and, and it's not often mm-hmm. that you have, that you're given the opportunity to be aware about it, aware mm-hmm. of it until it's too late and you're looking back with regret. Um, so I just, I, I was really struck by the way that it um, sort of made space to show you that like sometimes uh, relationships or or the way things work out is just hard regardless of of your actions or or maybe mm-hmm. you didn't intend something to go a certain way but that doesn't mean that the universe cares about what your intention was <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that you can't do it all i think yes it's like you know what you're saying right there it's like if i lean into one relationship or if i if i lean into prioritizing if I prioritize my career, maybe I'm not as there for my family. And I don't think it's never like, I think sometimes these things can be made out to be uh, more it, like, it's not demonizing any of it. Right. Like, it's not like if you choose to like really prioritize your career, your family isn't going to like completely abandon you and they'll all be terrible people. 
but there are things that will happen throughout the game that you just realize like because I wasn't there for X, Y, Z, like this is now my relationship with my son or this is now my relationship with my mm. daughter or my partner. Like these things are different now because I had a different priority than them. And, and same as if you prioritize them or you prioritize something else, then maybe you won't get where you wanted to get with your career. And mm -hmm. I think the game does a good job of saying like, this is all okay. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make your life not worth living because you made one little wrong choice, mm -hmm. but you do make these decisions on a daily basis and you do set your priorities and you're not going to be able to max every relationship out. <laughs> yeah. to, you're not going to be able to be there for every single person all the time. You're not going to be able to have, have it all. Um, yeah. Because time is fleeting and life is fleeting. It's also fleeting. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and I think this, the kind of the other thesis statement that I think the game makes that I think is like still resonating for me is there's, there's actually a moment in the game where Wit is having a conversation uh, with his son and he's talking about why he likes stories. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, I guess it's because stories are like dreams, except permanent. You never forget them because you can always go back and read them again. And they do the same things dreams do. They tell you about the world you live in, but they also help you imagine a different one, maybe a better one. And in a lot of ways, I think that's what this game is yeah. doing. It's like very, that, I think that's very much how the game and the, the game writers see this as a way to kind of reflect through the story to reflect life and the way we make decisions and set priorities back at us and, and ask us to just kind of think about it and recognize that you're making decisions every day that might feel small in the moment, but are, are setting your priorities and your focus and will have an impact on your relationships and where you get in life. Absolutely. If we're talking about thesis statements, I have mm -hmm. one too that I wrote down because yeah. I, again, this game like writing wise is bonkers. Good. Really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't um, have complaints about the writing except that maybe there might be too much of it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, uh, but see, that's one of the things that I loved about it was how sprawling it was. Like, it felt like an epic. Like, I was, mm -hmm. it felt epic. The scale was epic. Um, yeah. And that was something that felt really special. Like, I, I, I really felt like I was diving, like, like someone's life had been preserved in this game. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's really cool. Um, sorry, let me, okay, so this quote that I had written down, it was, um, a scene, one of the transitionary scenes where Wit's kind of like just reflecting on his life. And he says, uh, if you made different choices, you'd be a different person now. And the person you are tends to feel like the person you were always meant to be. Here's the problem. Every alternate version of yourself that could exist would feel like they're the only one who was meant to exist, just like you do now. So how much stock can we put in that feeling? Maybe meant to be is just our way of coping with the space we can't cross between what is and what might have been. Yeah. Um, and it just too feels <laughs> like this game is making the impossible possible. It's mm -hmm. allowing you to have that power to ask what if. Um, mm -hmm. And that is really special. Should we now talk about the things that frustrated us about the game? <laughs> <laughs> no, we just have some um, we, we loving critiques because we love this game. Or at least I, I really love this game. And I, I felt like there were just a few things that would have taken it to the next level for me. Mm. But I, I felt like because I was so focused on the story it was telling me and I don't know, it didn't bother me that much, but I know, Jamie, you had a slightly different <laughs> experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel really conflicted about this game. I I think this is like this year's spirit fair for me, where mm. I love what they're doing narratively, but I hate how they're getting there mm. um, mechanically. And, and I think that this one even like got on my nerves way more than spirit fair. Mm. There were... 
the you know we mentioned earlier that it's a 3D uh, sort of isometric viewpoint of the characters. Um, the way that pans out in so many situations is that you feel really distanced from your very small character on the screen. You're like for, God looking down on this world. Yeah. And for such a personal and like intimate story that's being told, I don't think that that did it any justice. Yeah. I think the the actual like mechanics of moving the character around and especially the way the camera functions to like follow the movement are it they're just kind of bad. They're just kind of bad. I kept wanting to be able to zoom in more. Like, I didn't understand yeah. why it wouldn't let me zoom in It gives closer. you a zoom button, and then inexplicably, at various points, you can zoom in, like, barely at all. You can yeah. bring your character from being an inch tall on the screen to being an inch and a half tall on the screen, and that's the end of the zooming. Whereas at other points, you can zoom all the way in and feel like you're in the room with the characters. And I just didn't understand, like... What was doing that? It seems like it's obstacles that are in the foreground of the screen that are preventing you from zooming all the way in, to which I say, why are there obstacles? Mm. Why, when I'm trying to run up these stairs, is there a tree in the foreground that's blocking my view of the stairs? So I just <laughs> mm. have to guess where the stairs are yeah. and then try to run up the stairs. Just just weird decisions. Yeah, yeah for the, how how detailed and thoughtful the I thought the world design was, like like in terms of literally the objects in the space, um, and the kind of the character of uh like like Wit and his brother, uh Wit, the character main character, they're like artists and sculptors and there's like like mm-hmm. buildings of uh, and construction are big aspects of the game. And so it was puzzling to me as well why we couldn't kind of, you know, zoom in more on all, all this cool mm-hmm. art and um, like the spaces that we're moving in. Um, it, it did feel very um, distant. <laughs> I also don't think um, so for much of the game, because you're, I mean, you're in this surreal space, right? Where you're essentially getting to, uh, Wit's life is essentially flashing before his eyes and you're Mm -hmm. kind of playing through it, right? And then making these decisions. Because of this, Wit is the only character that is like fully drawn out and all of the other characters in the game are presented as these ethereal, like ghostly light beings that have really no details outside of an outline. Yeah. First of all, half the time they were hard to see. Yeah. There were so many points where I was looking for someone and I just legit could not find them because I could not fucking see them. They all look the same too. Yeah. Why? (laughs) Yeah. They all look the same. I want to see these characters that I'm getting to know. I feel like it took so much away from the characterization to not be able to actually see these characters and who they were and what they look like. And they give you these really simple drawings of them and some of the interstitials, but Mm -hmm. like, I wanted to know what these people look like that I was spending all this time with. And then, so you inevitably like create a version of them in your head and then they bother to give you the drawing and the interstitial. And it's like, well, that's not what I pictured. <laughs> like why, like why, are, why this half measure? Yeah. It, it, to me at the end of the day, it felt like a misapplication of resources. Like you mm-hmm. have this excellent narrative. You have this really interesting like point that you're trying to make and I just feel like they they built mechanics around that, that it was like they wanted to give people something to do besides just, it, it was like they were afraid to make a visual novel. Mm. They were afraid to make something that was just totally focused on the narrative and felt like they had to give players something to do mechanically to keep them invested. And I would have rather they just leaned into what they had. Right, because what it kind of turns into is running all over the map, trying to find the right ethereal blob to trigger the the next Mm -hmm. conversation or next plot point. And half the time they don't even put their names over their head or anything. So you have to go up and try to talk to everybody until you find the right person. Yeah. Um, and that, and those moments where you don't immediately know where to go, um, Mm -hmm. just because you are just a person running around, like it can take some time to get all across the map to find the people you need to find. Um, so yeah, that, that, frustrated me as well um i did feel like i wasn't sure if the point of the ethereal spirits was just that because the writing is so vivid like maybe they don't need to be personified because you get well i don't know even because even the drawings that were included if you kind of just put basic detail onto the like uh, 
yeah, they could have, it, it, it was rough <laughs> that part. Yeah. And, and like it, it felt like, I don't know if this is what happened at all, but it just felt like they ran out of time and resources because they don't animate their, the other characters movement either. And so it felt to me like they just didn't have time and resources to animate all these characters and design them all. And so they did this as like a way to fill them in. And I just feel like at some point in the process, I felt like they made the (laughs) decision. Speaking of priorities, I just felt (laughs) like they made the decision to prioritize the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I I also do think, you know, 600,000 words, a lot of the line by line is really good. At At the end of the game, I felt like it was getting a little long in the tooth. My playthrough was 15 hours and I was just like, I got the point. I got what you're trying to do. I don't it, 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 in the delivery. There's, there's a point at the end of the game where they're kind of giving you almost an epilogue for all of the characters mm-hmm. that you've met in the game. And the way a lot of that presents is like just pages of text on the screen. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It, it especially because it was like 10 different characters that it was just presenting me like with pages of text on the screen. I don't have a problem with the visual. Like I love a visual novel, but it was just like the way they were doing it. The text wasn't very big. It was a lot of extraneous detail that I didn't feel like I needed that didn't serve the story. So I do feel like they also could have maybe used an editor. Like yeah. maybe we only needed 500,000 words. Yeah. Yeah. I think zooming in, I, I think trading some of the mechanic uh, complexity for just being able to see these characters uh, and and really get that rounded out um, within these settings would have been awesome. I think one other thing that stood out to me was, um, like I mentioned, Wit is an artist and a and a builder. He's someone very mm-hmm. gifted with construction. He has the vision and is able to deliver the execution. Um, and throughout the game, you have these various opportunities to, uh, you know, create buildings, repair barns, um, make sculptures, build homes. Um, and the functioning of that, like, again, when we talk about resources that maybe could have been allocated differently is like, I would have traded being able to run around freely during these chapters in this open world and trying to find people for just being able to, um, in those moments where you're constructing something, have that be really interactive. Um, because throughout the mm-hmm. game, um, all you do to build things is hold down a button. You hold down a button and everything just magically flies and lands and into place and, and the thing is done. Um, and it, it just felt sort of distant from who Wit was, like as an, uh, an artist. Like I wanted to kind of feel like I was being part of that. And so like, yeah, I would have been cool with not, with just having scenes where the dial, where it's dialogue zoomed in talking heads. And then when I'm building something, which happens several handful of times, like half a dozen or maybe 10, even a little bit more than that. um, Having that be feel more like I'm having an impact in shaping that would Mm -hmm. have been cool. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know if I full on like recommend people get this game. I think it's $25. Uh, I do think the narrative is worth checking out. Um, just, you know, be aware. It's a really good narrative. It might, fr- the mechanics might frustrate you. A little bit. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I, I really like the game. I, I think I'm, I agree that some, some of the, mechanics were a little frustrating but I felt like what I was experiencing was was really special and it gave me a lot in terms of what I was able to take away from it um and so I think if you're someone who really likes reading (laughs) like seriously like if you're someone who loves books and stories um and sort of games that aren't necessarily about um Slice of life. This is this is slice of life. That it's like the drama of everyday life. Yeah, like, I think I just really I really like things that feel real and, and grounded mm-hmm. in that. So if you if you're really into slice of life stuff, I I, I I recommend it. Yeah. So that's what we think of where the heart leads. Some mixed feelings around an overall like really thoughtful, compelling story. Yeah, rich 
rich discourse, lots of opposing viewpoints on where the heart leads. So. I'm not sure that we've like disagreed on a game like that before. I, you weren't as hot on Spirit Fair, I remember. Yeah, but I felt like we all we under you understood why. Like we both kind of had yeah. similar reasons why um, we weren't as into it, but you were able to see it through, whereas I sort of petered off. Mm-hmm. Um, but with this game, I don't know. Yeah, it does seem like we're ha- like. I think your reaction to the mechanics is like more visceral than mine because I was so mm-hmm. hooked into the story that I almost kind of didn't care. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah. But, um, I wonder too if like you uh, got a review copy so you had some more time to breathe with it. Mm-hmm. I got it on Tuesday and crammed through it in four days. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder if that maybe has an impact. Like, I think it's a lot to speed read. (laughs) I wanted to, it's not even the read. Like I have no problem with the amount of text that was in the game. I don't like it. Yeah. It, it, I was, I would have appreciated the way the interstitials played out where they really took control out of your hands and you were just being presented with screens of characters talking to each other. I think if the game had been more that I would not be as frustrated with it Mm, mm -hmm. as I was. I just really did not like moving through the world. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I think also if maybe I had had I had just taken more breaks while I was playing it, maybe the frustration wouldn't have felt so mm-hmm. intense. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I'm glad that we played it. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll disagree again in the future. Can't wait. Looking forward <laughs> to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and move over to our interview. Uh, our interview for you today is definitely not safe for work. Um, so, un- <laughs> well, you know, unless maybe you work from home. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> as long as you work from home by yourself. Have privacy at home. <laughs> Have privacy at home when you listen to this interview. Uh, our guest is the prolific Anna Valens, who we discovered through her reporting work for The Daily Dot, where she specialized in online queer communities, marginalized identities, and adult content creation. But she is also a game critic, has written a book called Tumblr Porn, and has developed several adult games herself. We had a riveting and at times titillating <laughs> conversation with Anna about sex in games, the necessary exploration of desire, leaning into pleasure, and the importance of kink as both a historical and current feature of LGBTQ culture. At the time that we interviewed her, Anna was still working and writing for The Daily Dot, and you'll hear us reference it throughout the interview. However, a quick note that she did recently take a position as managing editor for We Got This Covered, a pop culture news and review site covering movies, TV, comics, and games. So congrats on the new job, Anna. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo. <laughs> we had a lot of fun chatting with her. We think you're going to enjoy it, too. So without further ado, here's our interview with Anna Valens. Hello to our wonderful guest, and thank you so much for joining us in the virtual pixel therapy studio. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> we're so happy to have you. Um, I'm really, really, really honored to be here. So, <laughs> Could you take a moment to share your name, pronouns, and just a bit about how you spend your time? Yeah, sure. So my name is Anna Valens. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a uh, a little bit of a games writer, a little bit of like an adult games developer. I specialize mostly in the intersection of sex and sexuality and video games and what uh, the two have to say about the other. Since surprisingly, there's a lot that sex can tell us about games and there's a lot that games can tell us about sex. They both have to do with play, right? So Mm. a lot of my work looks at that stuff, looks at from a, I would consider it a very um, accessible and approachable level, since a lot of that sort of writing can be very like academic y jargony and kind of hard for folks that really aren't in that world to understand. And um, very, very queer. You know, I create like adult games that are like predominantly about like lesbians and trans lesbians. So that's really, right. really my shtick. <laughs> and Anna, how did you sort of get into this beat of writing at the intersection of sexuality and gaming? It was largely a coincidence. Uh, (laughs) So I always loved games that had a lot to say about sex um, and were interested in exploring sex and sexuality. Um, Mm -hmm. But what actually happened for me that got me into writing more about it was I was working at the publication that I'm at right now, which is Daily Dot. 
And we had to do something called search engine optimized content. Mm. This is sort of like your listicles and guides, guides to things like, um, you know, this can be everything from like in the games world, like walkthrough guides to mm. things like top 10 lists of like games to check out for this year, you know, that kind of content. And what ended up happening was I was writing a lot because there was a demand for it because it was interested in sort of pushing and prodding and seeing what I could write about it. There was a demand for um, doing content about sexuality. And mm. I took that and was writing like BDSM and porn guides. And I was like, what if I write this about video games too? And so like one thing led to another and I ended up doing a lot more writing about games and sex. You know, what are some good adult games out there? What do you, again, you know, mm. what does games have to tell us about sexuality? And uh, I kind of fell down the sexual rabbit hole, so to speak. And here I am now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm curious to hear from you, like what makes a good adult game like I, like I guess I feel like in film and in art and in books like sex is very much accepted as being a really valid part of understanding a character or moving a narrative forward um like there's plenty of of uh you know stories that contain sex and, and some like really explicit sex but we don't think of it as pornography we think of it as like one film I think of as like Brokeback Mountain for example which is like lauded as a critical you know, a uh, piece of film and a critically acclaimed piece of film. And we don't look at it and uh, automatically disregard it or discard it because it contains graphic sex scenes. We see it as something um, like emotionally impactful uh, and, va and valid. And, and I feel like when we talk about sex in games, there's this immediate like connotation that, oh, it, it must be a farce or it must just be pornographic, which is also fine. <laughs> but like, I guess I'm, I'm just curious to hear from you, like, like what makes a good adult game and what kind of, what kind of varied experiences can we have with sex in, in games? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, I think it really does depend. It depends what kind of, uh, you know, it depends what the creator is setting out to create and it depends what the player base is setting out to enjoy. Um, I've seen over the time that I've written about and also developed and played adult games, right? Um, I've seen all sorts of games come out of this world that uh, try to accomplish different things. I've seen games that really try to talk about like what is our cultural understanding of sex? What is sex education? What is uh, the way we talk about sex and discover it? Um, in those games, I would consider they technically fit the purview of like an adult game. But they're not really about like arousal or stimulation or titulation. They're more about like what can we learn about sexuality and our cultural relationship with sexuality mm -hmm. through uh, this work of art? Um, and I respect it. I like that work. Uh, but for me, I really like it when it's not afraid to also be like, by the way, this is going to be hot. We're going to rouse <laughs> you too. <laughs> yeah. I, I think like there's something that's very much like... Um, I think not always, but sometimes those 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 works of art, whether they're games or otherwise, that try to talk about sex purely in sort of like an intellectual way can mm. sort of like do a certain level of distancing itself from pleasure and from the ideas of like sexual pleasure and sex as something that not for everyone, but for a lot of people is a pleasurable act. Right. Um, so or something they seek out to to receive and experience pleasure. Um, so what's really interesting to me about adult games is there's actually a wide assortment of ways to unpack and explore pleasure. And you'll mm. have games that are really more specifically about like the game as a vehicle for arousal or, um, you know, more often than not, like masturbation, right? Uh, this is your kind of like traditional porn games, some of your like classic like 2000s, like flash games, you know what mm. I mean? The ones that's like a dress up doll game. Here's like Sama Saran, you get to put clothes on her for Metroid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> Those kind of games. Um, but also there's a lot of adult games that sort of sit at this intersection where where um, it's both supposed to be arousing or titillating, but it also has uh, commentary, it has things to say, it has things to talk about. Um, a really good example of that is like Ghost Hug Games is Hard Coded, which is a very, very mm. popular trans adult game mm. that actually didn't start. It was very interesting, actually. Um, it didn't start as necessarily an adult game by and for trans people. It was just by you know a trans person and sort of marketing itself to a popular sort of niche audience for adult content. But over time, it really became a game that 
resonated and was built for the trans community. And mm. it has a lot to say about, you know, what does it mean to have a body? What does it mean to have a gender? What does it mean to sexually express yourself through those things? Um, and sort of, uh, you know, I think validating can be a really squishy word and there's sort of problems with it. Uh, but it mm-hmm. does in a lot of ways... Um, sure, you know, like, fuck it. It validates a lot of desires and a lot of experiences that trans people have, uh, specifically trans feminine people, specifically trans women, um, and trans feminine non-binary people, uh, assigned male at birth. Um, Mm. it really explores and validates a lot of their experiences through sex and sexuality. So adult games can accomplish a lot of things. And uh, to successfully do it, it really comes down to, you know, like any kind of game design, right? Creators sitting down and thinking, you know, who is my target audience? What am I setting out to do through this game? How can my mechanics, story, et cetera, you know, accomplish these goals? Mm -hmm. And so you get a really a wide assortment of works as a result, some good and some not so much. (laughs) I really... um... I, I, there's just what you said got me thinking like about uh, how games can sort of um, explore like what it means to have a body and, um, you know, kind of create these spaces to explore um, in most cases, like I would say a safe way, like desires um, or things with your identity that you're still trying to figure out, like it kind of creates a space for that. And I was, I mean, (laughs) not to get like crazy personal right now, but I, um, I'm a, I guess a trans man. I, I don't. I'm non-binary. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I've, I've been on T for several years, like four years now. Um, I am not a woman. I know that. Um, but I found that lately, like I have a have past sexual trauma, um, and I think a lot of like gendered sexual trauma, like this feeling of knowing or not knowing how my partner is seeing me like in bed like if I'm really being seen the way that I want to be seen or if they are you know in their head thinking of me as a woman in order to be aroused or because that's how they're used to having sex and expect like that's how they behave and while having sex etc um and I've, I've just found lately that Like, I think before the pandemic, like, kink was a way for me to, like, I found it very healing to sort of, like, not always have to be engaging in a sex, in sex that is necessarily, like, penetration is involved or, like, there's no role, like, the roles in kink are are less about gender and more about, like, power and, and negotiation and stuff. And so I could sort of let myself and my body, like, exist free of, gendered expectations or roles that are being placed on me. Um, and I, I guess post pand or during in this pandemic right now that we're still in kind of like, <laughs> like, I just haven't really had access to spaces where I could engage with kink or like, I haven't been to like a party or anything in like over a year and a half. Yeah. Um, oh, that, that hits home for me. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, who am I? <laughs> am I still a top if I'm not topping anyone? <laughs> yeah, right. So philosophical. I love that. <laughs> I top, but, therefore I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I just, this idea of, I've never, I, I've never really played an adult game. Like, I think this conversation, like, I think after this conversation, I might ask you, like, for some recommendation, or I might just start, I would like, love that. playing your games or something. But, like, this idea of, um, like, I, I think what I'm saying is, lately, like, right now, my confidence has been a bit down. Like, I, I, I haven't, it's not as easy as it used to be to just, like, get into the mood to have sex. And when I'm having sex, like, I don't even know what I want from it anymore. Um, and so this idea of being able to go into a space, especially like a virtual reality space, where I can just try different things and not necessarily, like I think part of uh, what makes sex hard for me as a survivor is that you might not know until you're in the middle of it that it's not what you want or that it's not feeling good. And I think for me, like a lot of my like, you know, PTSD reactions or, or, or stuff, it's like shut down. Like I go nonverbal and I might not even be in a space where I can say like, no, like I might even tell myself like, oh, like your partner is enjoying it. So just, you know, just get through it. Like it's for, you know, it's not even about you anymore. Um, and so we don't need to therapize me, <laughs> but I, I just, I think it's really, I, I love, I, I think games are vehicles 
that can help you, you know, they're amazing for empathy. They're amazing for discovering parts of yourself. They're amazing for just completely putting yourself in someone else's shoes and and and, and expanding your worldviews. And, and there's all sorts of ways that games, I think, can be beneficial. Um, but I never thought about it in a sexual context, but I think it could be incredibly healing in, in that mm. way. I definitely think so, too. I definitely have similar experiences as well. You know, my own relationship of sex with sexuality with also the weirdness of, like, you know, <laughs> being someone who has sexual desires and experiences Experiences, especially ones that are highly, um, you know, both as a trans woman, but also as someone who's kinky, who's a leather dyke, right? Someone who, you know, centers their sexual experiences in their life through power exchange, consensual power exchange, and the values that come from that. Um, you know, this very, this very marginalized sexual experience in the queer community, let alone, you know, the wider sort of, you know, heteronormative American, you know, white cis hat world. Mm. Um, it can be really, really difficult to piece together, like, what are our desires? What's, where does, where do I start and stop? Where does culture come in? What is, you know, mm. what is my body telling me that I even want? And can I trust my body? Can I trust my intuition? Um, and uh, like unraveling those things is really difficult. And I think, I do really think that games can be a space to sort of start um, untangling that that stuff and sort of figure it out. You know, um, one game that I actually really want to chat about today was Christine Love's, uh, you know, Lady Killer in a Bind, which is like yeah. the big like BDSM video game that like was written a ton about everyone. You know, it's like <laughs> to the point where it's like everyone has talked about it. Now it's my turn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but for a lot of people, that game. Um, open their eyes to a lot about kink and also sexuality and gender and identity and and exploring sexual desires that are like non-normative in a way that was i think really mm. healing for a lot of people and really made them feel like oh this is what this is like and this is what it can be like for me it's specifically in the context of that game of like in a gender non-conforming you know sort of sapphic scenario specifically in yes. that game and i think there's a lot of ways in which um games can provide that space or can give us sort of playgrounds to explore and experiment with desire. Like Hard Coded, which I talk about all the time in my work, um, has a lot of different kinks and fetishes that are like not really traditional BDSM leather kinks. Um, mm. You know, not your traditional like bondage and like impact play, getting spanked, stuff like that. But it does have, um, you know, like tentacles and like uh, there's this yeah. like really kinky. I know, right? I love tentacles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's like a great, like just take that out of context. Like I yeah. love I tentacles. tentacles. <laughs> Sound bite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good sound by yes. uh, and it has stuff too. Like I think one of the more like bonkers uh, things that they have in that game is like um, you're playing as a robot, like trans, you know, femme, right? Mm. So like you can get disassembled by like this trans girl that's like <laughs> up working on your parts and stuff like that, which is like super kinky. <laughs> yeah, and I love it. <laughs> And for some people, they're going to play that and they're going to be like, oh, shit, that's hot. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that. I didn't realize this is the desire I could have. But also, I didn't realize that I could explore and, and experience desire through this way in a way that feels good for me and doesn't feel like it has the complexities of, like, say, expectations being placed on me from a culture, a society of sex mm. that I don't know if I want to have. Um so, yeah, I really think games, you know, games is play and play usually is a really good way for us to sort of piece things out and understand ourselves better. And that's definitely true of sex games and adult games. I love that. I I also feel like <laughs> like the experience of being trans, I feel like opened so many doors in terms of what I found attractive or sexy. Like, I, I think, you know, being socialized growing up being told that I was cis like you just are told a very narrow and specific idea of like what is sexy what sex looks like um what you should find attractive and what you should not find attractive um especially with like the heteronormative uh, aspect applied on top of that um and I just feel like going through the experience of just totally opening myself up to transformation and and the unknown, and then sort of this constant process of becoming and sort of redefining my relationship with myself and and never being done. Um, like it's when I look outside of myself and especially with sex, like I'm like, furries are hot. Uh, <laughs> tentacles That's are absolutely hot. Absolutely true, by like, the way. <laughs> <laughs> like for I see why that's hot. Like, like I could, like I just, I'm like, when I sort of step back from what this, this puritanical idea of what we've been told about mor how morality can be applied to stuff like what you're into. Um, 
like, of course, within reason, like, of course, we can all agree that, like, pedophilia is wrong. Like, I'm not saying, like, oh, everything, it's all a free-for-all. But, like, right. <laughs> I just, there's so much more. And I don't know, just what you were saying about <laughs> tentacles, it just reminded me of, like, I feel like especially now that I'm in this place where I I have a really hard time in in meat space and IRL, like, engaging with sex in a, way that, in a way that feels good to me. It's, like, all that I can get off on is, like, insane hentai. <laughs> <laughs> Really, Come, just right? take me out. Just take me out of my body. <laughs> um, totally. I know. Anyway. I totally. I feel like that's. I feel like that's really relatable. I think it's a really, um, you know, uh, across transgender experiences. Uh, I think that's really the case for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, and I always caution a little bit of pathologizing kink because I think mm. I think actually in a lot of cases kink is not. It doesn't have anything to do with psychological, you know, experiences or trauma. I think actually people just find out that they're hot for things and then they sort of work yeah. backwards and try to understand why be- whereas we don't really do that for like cishet desires right right uh, exactly right like we don't talk about the idea of like you know like vaginal sex like you know when you were a kid like something traumatic happened now like you're into like vaginal sex like that's just not really how we talk about you know like cishet stuff um and i think that's definitely the case for a lot of like non-normative sexuality that's been sort of pressed in the underground for years and years and years. And I'm not even talking about BDSM, right? I'm talking about, you know, exactly the things that you mentioned, like, like, um, like Vor and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a lot more sort of the world of like fantasy fetishism, quote unquote. Um, like a lot of that stuff is just, it is because it is. And I don't think it needs a reason to exist. Yeah. But I do also think at the same time too, that there's a lot of truth to the fact that um, fetishism and kink gives, uh, it's considered like on the outlier of, of, you know, the normative sexual experiences to the point where a lot of it is like mm-hmm. not in the overton window. It's not really considered like, this is the kind of sex that you should be having. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think to then, you know, queer people, uh, love to, you know, they relish being in the, in that edge and that being in that level of like, this is not what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to totally revel here and I'm going to totally like party here and have fun and i think in the same way i think a lot of kink and fetishism accomplishes that and i think that's why so many um queer creators tend to create adult stuff that is like very very kinky and very very you know fetishy it's like of of course like we're going to create stories about like you know anthropomorphic like hot women that like step on you right because like that's what we do yeah yeah If it's okay with you, I kind of wanted to take a second to talk about something um, that's been on a lot of our minds. Like we're recording this during Pride Month, um, and there's been some particularly bad takes flying around this year around like there should be no kink at Pride. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) The classic June discourse. (laughs) Yeah, the classic June discourse. Um, (laughs) And I just wanted to call out this awesome piece that you wrote on your Medium blog, um, Not Safe For Who, called... Oh, uh, Substack, by the way. Oh, Substack. Sorry. Substack blog. (laughs) called Not Safe For Who, um, and the blog is called, I mean, the article is called Reframing Kink at Pride Discourse. Um, And you write, I don't see how you can advocate for queer liberation without concluding that yes, duh, queer kink is integral to a queer pride event. Leashes and O-ring collars are to leather dykes what marriage rings are to straight couples, which I love, I love that. Um, <laughs> skinny white women with no bras and exposed pelvises are paraded across Calvin Klein ads, but a gay man walking to Stonewall in a tight pair of leather jeans is labeled a child seducer. The 70s are calling, they want their homophobia back. Um, so first off, as like a leather dyke and a sexuality writer, I was wondering just for our listeners who maybe have no frame of reference for the kink community or what that means, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to what the leather community means to you and its impact on your journey in figuring out your sexuality. Yeah, so definitely um, leather, which I think sometimes can be really hard to pin down because in some ways it can be an umbrella of things. But, um, you know, leather is a community that emphasizes the importance of, you know, what we consider, quote unquote, alternative sexualities. But more specifically, the realm in which we look at power exchange and pain as pleasure and vice versa um, in consensual sexual experiences. It's about um, looking at sex and sexuality as something that goes beyond the realm of the most normative understandings of it and centering the idea that our sexual experiences, our, our desires, which may also be, you know, non-sexual. I, I like to use the term erotic to describe non-sexual, like BDSM desires, um, because there's so many ace kinkster, kinksters that don't have sexual experiences with kink. Um, 
And what the community, especially in my relationship to it, emphasizes is the importance of not just doing that sort of engagement with your desires of sadomasochism, of power exchange, of, you know, alternative sexual desires and needs um, or erotic desires and needs, uh, but also at the same time, centering the fact that those things are fundamental to one's life and fundamental Mm. to one's ability to exist, right? Like, it's not like I'm a weekend warrior that does a lot of BDSM and then goes home and has a normal life. It's, you know, I carry that around with me. That's integral to my existence. I am someone who my experiences with domination submission, my experiences of sadomasochism is part of who I am as a person. And the values that I learned from that play and that experience, whether it's, you know, consensual power dynamics, whether it's, um, you know, working through difficult and uncomfortable experiences as a place of growth, whether it's looking at relationships beyond a cishet normative lens and looking at the ways in which we can have, for instance, you know, domination and submission as the sort of consensual essential long-term framework, you know, Mm. people who live with their doms or see their domination submission relationship as something that's like a service-based relationship, right? Mm. Um, For me and for the way I would approach leather is that it's culminating how those experiences are innate to one's personhood. And Mm. so part of uh, what's really important about leather is the undercurrent of leather in queer experiences. Um, You know, there's a history of leather uh, that goes far beyond Stonewall. Um, There's actually a a really, really good book that I just read, uh, Leather Sex by Joseph Bean, which is from the 1990s. It's an older Mm -hmm. book and it's aged well in some ways and not so much in others. You know, leather Mm -hmm. is something that needs to be updated every couple of years, you know? Yes, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But but Leather Sex really has this interesting part at the end of the book where it details the relationship between, and this is sort of the stereotypical sort of understanding of leather, of of men coming home from World War II and developing these, uh, you know, what they're called at-your-own-risk gay bars, uh, Mm. where they were like leather bars. You would be these World War II vets that were sort of like acting out the power dynamics they experienced in the military in a consensual way. And, uh, you know, our initial early leather didn't have all the safeguards that we do now, but it absolutely was this way of understanding sexuality that broke from this idea that sex is something that is like, um, particularly a vanilla cishet model. Mm. And that's, there's an undercurrent there for sure that's always been there since Stonewall and since after that. And looking at Stonewall as a mythologized sort of story and ex- mm. looking at sexuality and, and especially working class queer sexuality beyond the image of just um, it didn't exist and then Stonewall happened and then it existed, which is a huge myth, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Um, but leather was so integral to a lot of the political organizing that happened, especially during the the eighties, the nineties, especially during the AIDS, uh, the AIDS epidemic, and especially when the AIDS crisis was really, really ravaging the queer community. Um, leather was really connected to a lot of the work that, say, you know, folks like ACT UP were doing in New York. Um, and so, I think it's important for people to remember that leather is both, you know. Uh, something that many people come to on a personal level and they decide this is my values and this is what's important to me, but also that there's a fundamental political undercurrent where leather has always been important to queerness. And so um, it's essentially rewriting that history when you're saying that leather doesn't belong at pride. It's like, no, it's vice versa. Like your understanding of pride came second. Leather was there first. So, Yes. And to your point, like I I feel like, you know, something that I learned about recently was that leather dykes um, specific, like, were specifically some of the only people who were willing to take care of gay men who were, um, you know, co- coming down with AIDS uh, when when society was casting them out. Um, like they were some of, they were caretakers within the queer community, um, and and two like <sighs> leather isn't always or kink isn't always overtly sexual. Like it's not even always about sex. And I think when we talk about this, this discourse around kink at pride, like what so often comes up is this uh, topic of consent. Like I did not consent to see kink when I went to this parade. Pride should be family friendly. (laughs) Pride should be, I saw the quote, Pride should be queer friendly, which I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you fully bought into this assimilationist idea that 
pride is about showing cis and cis het people that we are normal and should be accepted and aren't a threat to them. When exactly. it's like historically, queer people have been like literally forced out of every space to the point where we had no choice but to cruise in public because that was like the only place that we could engage in sex. We couldn't do it at home. You can't do it at bars. You can't, you know, you can't do it in all the places where cis het people very comfortably take for granted that they can like, you know, cruise for sex and go hook up in a bar bathroom. But for, exactly. for some reason, when queer people are doing it, it's like a crime. Um, exactly. It's, further proof that we're depraved monsters um oh, it's, do you mind if i uh build on that a little bit please yeah. please so <laughs> there was actually i remember uh, a couple years ago i was waiting for some medications at my clinic and i bumped into like this old queen who was like you know uh but definitely lived through like the 70s and 80s was like new yorker born and raised and who used to like hang out on the high line and used to hang out with like mm. sex workers and like trans women and stuff and he was talking about how much the village had changed uh mm. and he talked about how like he used to be able to go out in like the East village and he would just see like, you know, like men fucking in the middle of the street. Right. Mm. And there's a certain level to which that can get <laughs> mythologized and people will be like the East village was all public sex <laughs> all the time. And like, it's like, oh, wait, wait a second. But, um, I think a lot of people, especially people that are disconnected from the history of what public queer spaces were, don't realize the way in which, uh, like I've seen a lot of people say like, kink is different from sex at pride and don't get me wrong that is true like there mm -hmm. are a lot of asexual kink experiences and i think it's important to like also keep in mind the fact that kink is not innately sexual for everyone um so there is a level of, there is absolutely a level of truth to that but i also think people tend to overemphasize that to do a sort of respectability move of like sort yes. of wedging the issue and being like well we're not having sex in public we're doing kink but for a lot of people as well kink in public is leather sex, right? You know, it's sexual kink experiences. And um, not just that, but the traditional history of a lot of queer public spaces is one that's connected with public sex, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, whether it's like that quasi-public sex where you're like, you know, finding like a bathroom stall or getting like a secluded like park bush and like having sex or yes, that experience in the seventies of like being in a very, very public area and having sex. I think a lot of people are just connected from that history and don't necessarily understand. They've sort of bought this, this sort of like bundle of goods. It's like bill of goods that the exposure to that level of public sex is innately harmful to everyone. But there's really a difference between walking down the street and seeing like maybe two gay men, you know, really hooking up in an alleyway or even hooking up in the middle of the street versus like two gay men forcing you to engage in whatever mm. sexual experiences that they're having. And I think that gets obfuscated on purpose because, you know, it's especially always about, you know, either gay men or like trans women uh, that are being mm. too sexual in public. And it's always about this idea of conflating this idea that like to be exposed in a sexual experience. Uh, you know, a, a two people consenting to a sexual experience together in a place in public means that you're innately being invited into that sexual experience. Mm. Meanwhile, if you go to like a music festival, right? <laughs> like you see, see like two straight people fucking, which you absolutely yes. will <laughs> at like any of them. It's absolutely. not your problem. And like, you should just put the blinders on, not pay attention. It's not harming anyone. And like, if you're really that concerned, why did you bring your kids to Coachella? Like you knew this was going to happen. So mm -hmm. it's a total double standard. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the most traditionalist form of homophobia, which is that fear of of gay men basically, you know, destroying your family and destroying, you know, the the cishet order. And it's just um, not being connected with that history and not having, you know, elders, people that I would consider anyone who was alive during the, the AIDS crisis, uh, mm. not knowing those people means that we get these really, really terrible takes that are just mm. disconnected from history. <laughs> Yeah, like it, it really feels like this culture war. And I know it's, it's not new this year, but it just feels like it's becoming super visible right now within the queer community. Um, the, that despite, like in some ways, it feels like the normalization and like commodification of sexuality that we're seeing with like the rise of OnlyFans and the way that social media and apps like like Lex, Grinder, Twitter, Facebook, they kind of really facilitate like this casual hookup culture. Like it's pretty common to go on Facebook group 
that's just for cruising or to, you know, post hole picks on Grinder and like no one like like and have an OnlyFans. Like everyone has an OnlyFans and that's like great. Um but it it feels like there's this commodification normalization, but that queer people are still being held to this different standard. There's this, it feels like there's this push to assimilate that I think's largely been driven, um, you know, from like, you know, we achieved marriage equality and now we need to keep making queer identities like relatable and approachable to families and, and shrink down to be acceptable. Um, I, you had um, this quote from an article um no, it was a Daily Dot column that you wrote in 2019 um, for uh, about um, how being part of the leather community um, like helped you see that um, kink did belong at Pride. Um, and you quoted Chingy Nea, who is a um, sex colonist and chaotic bottom um, that we all <laughs> know and love. Shout out to <laughs> <laughs> um, And they wrote um, for them the publication them <laughs> that ex- uh, <laughs> that excluding pronouns. Yeah, confusing <laughs> pronouns yeah that excluding queer leather culture at pride would ignore the contributions of communities that were integral to uplifting some of the most marginalized subsets of the lgbtq community demanding spaces to conform to your specific preferences because you are uncomfortable with something is not the same as making spaces change because you are unsafe there is a dangerous conflation Sometimes we get triggered by things and it sucks, but it's our responsibility to work through our trauma and not demand that other people change how they live when they actually aren't harming anyone by being sexual or erotic with each other. Um, I think that just tied in a lot to what you were just saying. Um, I feel like this moral panic about sexuality like isn't just what it's a pride. Um, you've done a lot of really important and eye-opening reporting around the ways in which, you know, expressing sexuality has been increasingly censored in the past few years. Um, you know, we all remember in 2018 when Tumblr, which was like the place where I figured out I was gay and trans, started banning <laughs> a not Same. safe for work content, um, to Patreon starting to crack down on artistic content from some creators, um, to even like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook starting to shadow ban sex workers and not safe for work artists. Um, you wrote a really great article for The Daily Dot called um, Discord is the Latest Battleground for Moral Panic About Porn. Um, which was about Discord starting to limit access to not safe for work spaces for iOS users. Um, and this article you wrote, while political anti-porn stances are nothing new, adult content's increased scrutiny from above should be alarming. Institutional gatekeeping over sexual material would devastate free sexual expression online, robbing sex workers of their income and removing queer access to LGBTQ adult artwork and sexual health resources. If private companies are compelled by governments or advertisers to be arbiters of what parts of our bodies is acceptable content, the social progress of the past decades will slow, says Jillian New York, who is a director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, she writes for Salon, new technologies like virtual reality are coming of age. If such new platforms are held to puritanical, censorious standards, then yet another mode for self-expression will have been diminished before it even fully gets off the ground. Um, so it's like, why are Americans so anxious about porn? And like, why is feeding into this anxiety so dangerous? Yeah, you know, I think it's um, it's so complicated. And it's really tied up exactly in you know the things Chingy writes about, uh, the things the other leather decks write about, and also the general panic about you know kink at pride. Right, um, the American mindset of sexuality combined with this sort of Christian mindset, you know, this very specific like white Christian institutional mindset around sexuality, you know, conservative politics around sexuality, and the institutional nature in which that's sort of put into place. I talked to a sex therapist a few years ago when I was really starting to write more about the relationship between transness and kink, because there's a lot of, um, you know, when I was first transitioning and coming out, you know, most trans writing about sexuality was either sort of um, people would slip in like trans sex scenes and they're like larger mm. trans novels that weren't about sex. Or there was a lot of shame around being a trans person that wanted to have sex. There was, there was sort of like, I remember like really the like preeminent like trans discourse on Twitter was like, why did I have to be trans? This fucking sucks. Like, mm. uh, why? And I hated that. I thought it was terrible, especially because I really did. I like, I do like being a trans woman, right? So, like, why yeah. would I go around and like make my I whole love shtick? being trans? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like this whole shtick of like, I fucking hate being a trans person. Like, uh, that's not me, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's a terrible way to like sort of write about your own identity. Why would you carry that much shame around very publicly? And why would you, you know, you know? 
not even specifically doing it publicly. Like, just why would you let that sort of um, be the whole entire center of your your life? Um, mm. And so I remember really pushing back against that at the time when I was doing like this transsexuality, like sex ed column for a couple of years. I was writing about, you know, I was trying to depathologize or at least de uh, stigmatize the relationship that trans women had with forced feminization porn and other mm. forms of like uh, kinks that had to do with like gender play, right? Which is traditionally haunted trans women because cis men decide that, you know, we're all fetishists, which I mean, <laughs> we kind of are, but <laughs> <laughs> just not in the way that they're describing it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, basically what ended up happening was they had this really good cough of sex therapist here in New York who argued this idea, you know, that kink is really when you think about it, any sort of sexual preference that a person has, um, you know, I would granted expand that definition to any sort of like erotic or sensual preference a person has, mm. not just sexuality, but in the framing of like sexual desires, any, you know, in that case, any sexual um, preferences a person has. So when you think about it, kink is really something that can be a kink for vaginal sex, right? Mm. Um, a kink for getting married and having sex, right? <laughs> uh, very kinky, you know, vanilla is the kinkiest yeah. of all kinks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put a ring on it. It's like, oof. Um, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else getting hot in here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but she, she made this really good point. Um, and one of the reasons why she started with that when we were just we were having a chat was she wanted to stress the fact that so much about our contemporary understanding of sexual desires is built around the idea that there are normal desires and there are abnormal desires. There are desires that are the ones that you are sort of innately born with that are mostly mm -hmm. reproductive in nature. And then everything else is what you're what is sort of like you're adding it on to what's supposed to be the reproductive essential of sex mm -hmm. and the point that she was making was when you have a cultural institution that insists on that that insists that this is the way we're going to think about sex and there's no other way to think about sex and this kind of sex that we're having is good and the kind of sex that you're having is bad then you're creating a way where sexuality becomes the it's sort of like the the tipping point of the spear where you can then control other ways that people think and talk mm. and 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 uh, really assert a sort of authoritative, uh, authoritarian control over other people. And that really stuck with me when she spoke to me about that, because I absolutely think that's true. I think the idea that our sexual desires are innately reproductive and then are have all this other crap added onto them, I think that's bogus and not true. And I think when you start to think of sexuality and desire as something that is way more malleable than that, then you start to realize how certain people's kinks are all over the place in the world and other kinks are highly marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. So the Calvin Klein thing is a great example or like marriage stuff is a great example. Like you can really think of that marriage as literally, and I mean, it's the most literal way possible, not just a metaphor. It is a kink, right? Marriage is a kink. <laughs> it yeah. is. And and so is like the Calvin Klein ads of like, you know, the very like white cishet beauty standards of a very skinny person, uh, you know, only wearing like the Calvin Klein boy shorts panties and like barely anything else. And mm -hmm. that's OK to have in Broadway. But if you have like a leather ad somewhere or a leather person walks around, that's bad. Well, that's right. because certain kinks are okay in that context and the rest aren't. And um, I think getting people to think about sex and sexuality that way and why there's such a moral panic over preventing that thought process is really, really important. I do, and this is sort of was at the core of that one Substack, that Substack article that I wrote. I do think it's also possible for people to overstate the case or, or um, sort of create a counteractive moral panic that causes a lot mm. of the problems with, say, like horizontal violence or accountability abuse that I also write about a lot in my work. So I do caution people to really pinpoint the specifics of the problem and to really focus on understanding and studying how this happens, because it's very easy to get people panicked and afraid mm. for things that maybe uh, will be detrimental to them as marginalized people, like, you know, scaring sex workers about a platform change that might not actually be happening um, is a really classic example. Um, Sort of like also like that sort of clickbait tech world where civilian writers will like make people scared or uncomfortable about changes that might not be coming up. Mm. It's possible to also overstate the case, but it is a serious problem. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the potential for panic that's unwarranted aside, there is, I think, 
definitely enough reason to be concerned and anxious and afraid about like what direction that sort of mindset of like we need to get sex off the internet like that is a huge problem no matter what and it's justified to be scared of that On this podcast, I, we typically like to hear from people about a specific game that's had an impact on your on their life. Um, you brought up Lady Killer on a Bind, which I'd love to come back to for these last few minutes we have together. Um, so also known as, my twin brother made me cost just as him, and now I have to deal with a geeky stalker and Dom Beauty who want me in a bind, or... Lady Killer in a Bind um, is a 2016 <laughs> erotic visual novel by Christine Love. Um, it's described as an erotic romantic comedy about social manipulation, cross-dressing, and girls tying up other girls. Classic visual novel content. <laughs> um, and so I was reading about the game, and I think it's really unique that this is a game about queer women by a queer woman um, that's really making space to explore fantasies that we're often made to feel like we can't or shouldn't talk about. Um, and I think especially that it's created from a queer woman's perspective, because so often I feel like a lot of these games are like made for men and, and like marketed to men. Um, and it, Lady Killer in a Bind is also known for its like really progressive uh, and inclusive writing um, in a visual novel. There's this quote that stood out to me um, from the main character where she says, listen, sex isn't about good. It's not a sport that you win or lose. It's about communicating feelings. There's no wrong way to communicate about how you feel as long as you're honest. Um, and so I guess just opening it up to you, like tell us more about this game and, and why it's been so important to you. Sure. Oh, I could talk literally endlessly about Lady Killer in a Bind. It is so, so good. Um, you know, one of the things I really liked about the game from the start was, um, and I was thinking about this a little bit as, as I was getting ready for this podcast, I was thinking about how it's sort of, there's like this oscillation that it has between being a little pulpy and like being a little tongue in cheek and celebrating that. But also at the same time, it tends to have a lot of um, these very realistic depictions of sexuality. And these realistic depictions of kink and BDSM. And that really is like represented in one of the routes that you can choose as a player because you can sort of choose like what's sexual counters to have and like who to hook up with or who to help like them explore their their uh, sexual desires or lack thereof, um, which is another key part of the game. Um, and one of the characters that you can uh, you can visit is the beauty, who's like the dom. She's like the classic like femme dom lesbian that like is really really good at tying you up and bringing you pain, but is also very considerate about everything and will communicate with you about boundaries and things like that. And one of the things that always stuck with me from the very very start of playing that game was the fact that um, it emphasizes so much about the ways in which BDSM is not just something that you jump into and do. It's mm. something that you communicate around, you talk things through, you have a prior understanding of how you engage in sadomasochism or bondage or domination submission. It's something that involves the ability for one to understand and know their desires and work through with another person in reaching those desires. And that mm. was always key to that game. And that at, uh, at the time, you know, as someone who, um, you know, had never actually done any um, in-person BDSM before I had done like role plays over the internet and stuff like that. And, you know, I was always aware of the fact that like we talk about what we're going to do and like we're going to figure mm. out what our desires are and work through it. But I never really had an understanding of like when you do in-person kink, which I had done at the time this is how BDSM plays out. This is how you communicate with partners. This is how you have sex and or whatever sort of play that you're going to have. Um, and along with another work that at the time I was reading called Sunstone, which is like a classic lesbian comic that mm. similarly does that interplay of like, we're going to do realistic discussions of BDSM along uh, with this story that is going to talk about all sorts of things like, you know, power dynamics and relationships between people and shame and trauma and recovery. Um, those two works together, but especially in the games world, Lady Killer really opened my eyes to a new way to think about BDSM in a way that I just I'd never understood before. And for me, it was really, really influential. And um, I think I would like to say, I hope others feel this way, but in my games, I think its influence can be really felt because so much of my games are about 
not just using BDSM as a vehicle for some sort of, say, exploration of desire or making people feel hot when they play my games. But <laughs> the point of the game is, you know, the domination submission, the sadomasochism, whatever kink your fetishy thing is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, in both of the like erotica games I've put out, which is uh, Blood Pact and She Hungered, um, the the former of those two is like really like the BDSM game that people are really familiar with. Um, Kotaku wrote it up and everything, uh, whereas She Hungered is like the more fetish fetishy <laughs> fantasy fetishism one. But they both are really about like what happens when we explore and understand our desires, what happens when we communicate them, what happens when the things that we're afraid of coming true do come true that we actually really, really, really want. And um, you know, really cool hot stuff happens when they do apparently. So <laughs> hmm. Awesome. And I do want to, when we talk about this game, like as I was reading about it, um, I came across like, so there's a scene late in the game um, where your character is sort of put in this highly erotic, but I would say maybe dubious consent situation where, um, you know, she's a lesbian, um, but she's in this like power exchange dynamic with a man. Um, and there were a lot of players of the game who were triggered by this scene and, and they they didn't want, they didn't think that it belonged in the game, which was a game that's very much about consent and, um, you know, exploring BDSM um, in like a positive, sex positive way. Um, but this scene kind of stuck out to the point where um, the creator of the game, uh, made an update where that scene was skippable and all sex scenes were skippable um, to kind of give players more control over how they were engaging with it. Um, But there was this really great article in Polygon by Merritt Kay and um, Simone de Rochefort um, called Lady Killer in a Bind shows that we're not ready to handle messy queer stories. And they write, "Um, there is no way to please everyone when writing about sex, especially with an issue as controversial and subjective subjective as kink, but we keep demanding an impossible level of precision when dealing with messy topics, especially from queer developers. The backlash to this sex scene shows that the pressure is still on queer creators to write perfect queer experiences. This is not the way that we should be teaching queer creators to approach their work. There's already a dearth of queer stories out there, and it's understandable that the hunger for this kind of content could set audiences up for disappointment when they when what they get isn't exactly what they're looking for. But if the only stories we're allowed to write are so antiseptic, affirmational, and toothless that they can't explore actual fantasies that queer women have, even if they are problematic, then we are failing. And I just thought that that this really resonated with me. And I I think too ties back to even the conversation we're having about, you know, kink at pride is just that there's so few queer content out there that the stuff we get, it's like, if it's not exactly what we needed, then then we say like it shouldn't exist, or right. this this uh, this triggered me, so it shouldn't exist. And it's like, hey, I'm the first to admit I have some pretty fucked up sexual <laughs> fantasies when I'm alone, and and to say that it shouldn't exist just because it makes you uncomfortable is kind of against the point of like queer art in the first exactly. place. Exactly, <laughs> it's all about making us comfortable. Yeah, I always um, I always liked that that article, um, and I always really agreed with a lot of it. Uh, you know, I've had some friends that also write in the sex games world that has have disagreed with it and have argued. Well, I think the option to have the cutscene be skippable is a good idea. I remember. Yeah. My myself reaching that play scene and uh, or that scene in the game and feeling a little uncomfortable even though i traditionally like dub con work more so yeah. because it was unexpected but i was actually thinking about this a lot before i came on here because uh it's very interesting i mentioned like how lady killer and a is the game that oscillates between pulp and realistic depictions of sexuality and i i read somewhere a really good analysis of that scene in another one where you're not the submissive partner but you're the dominant partner in the scene mm. And those two character routes were really, uh, the analysis that one player had was they were supposed to be foils to your experience as a dominant or submissive in the main character routes where everyone was sort of engaging in dom and subplay in a way that was very, like, you know, communicated and people were coming to the space for the right reasons. They were not doing it just to break people. They were doing it to explore and explore desires. And the point of the... um, those scenes, the way that player analyzed them, was that these were supposed to represent what happens when things go wrong in a play scene. This is mm. what happens when that desire is not 
coming from a place where the other person's safety or consent is put in place, or people are coming in with a fictitious and fantastical and a non-safe way of thinking about kink and thinking about what DS is. And mm-hmm. I really agree with that a lot. I think building off of that original article that, you know, um, it was Simone and Merritt, right? Yes. Yeah. The, building off that original article that Merritt and Simone wrote, I think those scenes... Christine Love likes to add in a lot of her work scenes that uh, rattle up the player, makes them a little uncomfortable or sort of shocks them a little bit. And from a narrative perspective, to make them think a little bit harder about the messages that she's sending in the work about the relationship between sex and identity or sex and desire or, you know, when something that feels like it crosses a line can at the same time still feel good and how uncomfortable Mm -hmm. that is, but it still is and working through that. Um, I think in the same way, I think that's what those scenes were supposed to accomplish. It was supposed to say, this is a great thing. BDSM is great if you do it in a way that's responsible. And this is what happens when it's done irresponsibly. And I do think it really defeats the purpose to make people... um, I I think a lot of people missed that message, even though it is Mm. a really important one. And so, uh, yeah, it does... I, I don't entirely mind that they were added as a skippable scene because I think personally for me, even though that analysis I think rings true, I think that scene at the end of the game missed the mark for me and I just felt like it didn't quite accomplish what Love was setting out to do if that's what she was doing. But yeah. I also think the idea that it's innately bad in the game or it's something that people should be particularly... Um, that queer creators should not put in their work. I mean, the reality is, you know, Lady Killer is more than just a game that sort of is super, uh, you know, is just sending you like five sex scenes to play through and then you're done. It is a game about a lot more than just BDSM play and like your own arousal and, and exploration. So I think the fact that people weren't ready for that is sort of a testament to the lack of maturity about uh, queer adult content and queer mm. content in general in the games world in the first place. And some issues with the fact that we don't always allow queer creators to take those experimental steps in their work. We we force them to Disneyify their work. They have to be like good stories of happy endings where no one gets hurt and you as the reader don't get uncomfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Anna, for for sharing space with us um, and taking the time. Where can people follow your work or keep up with your games? Like, where can they find you online? Sure. So uh, these days, I'm a little bit off social media. I am on Twitter on AC Valens. If you want to shoot me a follow request, I'm happy to add you. Um, I'm also on Instagram a little bit more publicly, also at AC Valens. Both are spelled A C V A L E N S. If you want to stay in touch with the work that I'm putting out, Daily Dot is the best place, best best (laughs) space to go to. So check out the podcast description. You can check out my latest (laughs) article. You can check out my latest articles there. And if you want to check out my video games work, um, also acvalence.itch.io. Lastly, one more thing I do have to plug. Uh, Yes. I (laughs) I actually wrote a book about the relationship between (gasps) Tumblr porn and sex work and accountability abuse and queer pornography's creation. Um, That's called Tumblr porn, and that'll also shoot over. You can check it out in the podcast description if you want to read. It's like a semi-memoir, semi-nonfiction overview of like the relationship between Tumblr and sexuality and what it means for online future. Oh my god. Okay, <laughs> clicking by right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much Anna for joining us on Pixel Therapy. Seriously a pleasure. Thank you. I'm really grateful to always talk about this stuff. up for today's session of pixel therapy thank you for tuning in and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own if you want more pixel therapy come check us out at patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just two dollars a month plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly If you're not up for contributing monetarily, but you enjoyed this episode, you can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and following us on Instagram at Pixel Therapy Pod. That stuff is just as important, and we appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network, so you can support us by supporting them and heading over to ButWhyThoughPodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they're building around pop culture news reviews and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly. And you can keep up with all of this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. 
finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you, Anna, for this week's side quest, which is Red Canary Song. Originally founded in 2017 to provide legal and healthcare support to the family of massage worker Yang Song, who was killed during a police raid, Red Canary Song is today a grassroots massage worker coalition in the U.S. There are over 9,000 workplaces across the country with no political representation or access to labor rights or collective organizing. Anti-trafficking nonprofits that claim to speak for migrants in sex work promote increased policing and immigration control, which harms rather than helps migrant sex workers. Red Canary Song also organizes transnationally with Asian sex workers across the diaspora in Toronto, Paris, and Hong Kong. To learn more and support their work, please check out redcanarysong.net. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel Pixel Therapy. therapy. Yeah. Got it. (laughs) 